paranoid, militant, violent nigger. I read this to show that there is a powerful sense of disillusionment among minority people. And that, disillusion, that sense of disillusionment itself creates advantage, regardless who's to blame for creating it. And there's more than just a sense. It's tangible. People who were born in this country, and I include myself, and have no other nationality to claim other than British, are regularly still asked where they are from. There are different ways that people ask this. Um, but you'll be, you'll be asked, you know, where, where are you originally from? Where are your parents from? Ultimately, people want to know why you're brown and in this country. <laughs> and they'll keep asking until they find a way of getting to that solution. You answer, I'm from, I'm from Wimbledon, is what I usually say. That, that, that rarely satisfies. Um, that might seem like a minor thing, but what it does is reinforce the sense that as a black person in this country, you're still not part of this society. You still have this otherness that people want explained. And there are tangible everyday facts that reinforce this. We heard about the ethnic penalty in the labor market. Um, you might have noticed that I'm pregnant and I'm at the stage of thinking about my child's name. And I have been given very well-meaning advice by very many black people that I should not allow my child to have my partner's surname. It's an African name. Um, and they are sure that if I give my child that name, it will disadvantage this child throughout its life in this country. And you might dismiss that as paranoid, but there was um, research by the Department of Work and Pensions not long ago that found out that um, applicants who applied for jobs whose name suggested that they were white were almost twice as likely to receive a favorable response than similarly qualified ethnic minority candidates or people whose names suggested that they were from an ethnic minority background. And then it's not just a question of, of being employed, but the areas of employment that minority people are in. Minority people are still crowded into the lower paid areas of their professions. In law, which is the background that I come from, the median income for white solicitors is still £10,000 more than the figure for minority solicitors. And even when variables like experience, region, size of firm, and area of law practice are taken into account, the average income gap is still 17%. I'm not talking here about people who are at the bottom of society. I'm talking about people who have made it through school, through university, qualified in the professions. There is still a tangible gap. And then last week, there was this whole debate about whether black people face discrimination in the countryside. I couldn't resist bringing this up because we all know about the comments that Brian Chumay made that a drama, he was the producer of Midsummer Murders, um, a drama with a rural setting wouldn't work, those are his words, if it included um, any black characters. But just this week, the University of Leicester um, published research which states the following. Minority ethnic people are often treated with suspicion in the countryside, as many white rural residents felt they belonged in the city. The rural, in their eyes, was an escape from all of those things, and the presence of a minority ethnic family suggested that the city was somehow invading the space of the tranquil rural they so treasured. This may not seem important again, but how could it possibly be that race is no longer a significant disadvantage when minority people are still fighting for the right to be recognized as part of this society, not just in the lower parts of um, the social scale and not just in the major cities, but in the professions, in the countryside. These are the battles that are still being fought every day. And for me, there's an irony about this debate, really, because for many people who feel at the sharp end of this disadvantage, they don't have the luxury of debating whether race is still a significant disadvantage. They're simply getting on with trying to succeed in spite of it. David brought up class, and it's always very difficult to talk about race disadvantage without addressing the question of class. And much of this does have to do with class and poverty, but not all of it. Um, and Tony was saying um, that he got five young men into Oxford, and I think we rightly applauded that as a real achievement. Um, I strode the corridors of Oxford. I studied there. Um, I saw the world as my oyster when I went there, which I credit to the upbringing I got from my parents. Um, but when I actually got to Oxford, I found that experience so difficult as a black person that I came close to dropping out. 
And last month, Oxford actually invited me back to the university to give um, a speech about the experiences of black students at Oxford. And in preparing it, I researched widely among other minority students I knew who'd been to Oxford. And what I found was really disturbing. And there was a pattern that these students, who'd already excelled at school, so they're already in the minority, they're coming from backgrounds that, for whatever reason, have allowed them to get through school um, and, and get through the perils of growing up, often in inner-city environments. Often, once they got to Oxford, came close to dropping out, like I did, because of the social difficulties associated with being a black person in an almost exclusively white environment. And the failure of Oxford as an institution to offer them any support, a failure which, by the way, still persists to this day, um, meant that many of them were not able to reach their potential there. And two people I knew while I was at Oxford, um, who came very close to crumbling altogether while they're there, ended up getting firsts, graduating with firsts. So if there was any doubt about their ability um, and their legitimacy being there, that dispels it. But every single black Oxford student I spoke to also said that they felt strongly about increasing the number of black students at Oxford. Yet at the same time, they expressed feelings of profound guilt because they were encouraging other minority people to apply. And they said that they felt that they knew they were setting these students up for the same miserable experience that they had had. That's the dilemma facing people who are currently in the most elite position in our society. And as a black woman who went to Oxford, I am in the minority. And other black people remind me of this all the time. Um, and I'm told, and it's not just the fact that I went to Oxford, I also went to a private school. Um, and so I'm told that I'm not one of them. I'm not really part of the black community. There are different ways of saying this. You're not a proper black person. You have not had the black experience. I don't say this to try and argue that black people have a, a low sense of aspiration, although you could, you could look at it from that perspective. Um, but what, what I think is, is much more profound, actually, is that race and disadvantage have become so closely bound together that now the perception of many black people is that if you are not disadvantaged, you are not really black. OK. Um, so, and I, it's good timing because I'm at the end. Because I'm letting you talk for longer. So just to finish, disadvantage is so real and so deep that it's actually become part of the black sense of identity. To dismiss it as a fiction is as insulting as it is ridiculous. And I'm disturbed by Tony's argument that acknowledging race and the disadvantage that goes with race creates problems between communities. This is not about whether acknowledging the disadvantage associated with race is a good or bad thing. It's about facing up to the truth that it is a disadvantage and it is significant. And we can only tackle that if we face it head on. Thank you. Thanks very much. OK, we're going to open this up to the floor. I, I don't know if this is a, whether we've got any microphones. Yes, we do. Two microphones. Um, <coughs> since I mentioned at the outset that everyone in the audience has some sort of connection to the issues that we're talking about, do feel free, if you think it's relevant, to tell us who you are. Um, we'll start with the gentleman just there. Thanks. Um, is it on? OK. Um, I think there's um, a risk in a debate like this um, that it polarises into a kind of red and blue cornered uh, boxing ring, in a sense, with, with each caricaturing the other. Um, I mean, no doubt there are those who, who want to deny the existence of racism, just as there are those who assume racism uh, to lurk almost everywhere, you know, like um, witchcraft was once imagined. But the worst caricature and I'm not saying it's happened tonight, but it does frequently happen. Uh, the worst caricature of all, um, I think, is the one made of those who criticize uh, state multiculturalism and the phenomenon we might call um, official anti-racism. It's as though criticism of how ethnic diversity is managed is presumed to be an attack on the lived experience of diversity itself. And I want to be able to say that Britain's proliferating diversity is something that makes society immeasurably better. But I also want to be able to criticize policy and how modern day anti-racism can get things very, very wrong. And if, if you don't mind, I'll give you an example, because I work in schools, primary schools mostly. Um, I've made some films for schools, 
on diversity and race issues in the past. But I ended up stopping that and writing about it. I wrote a report called The Myth of Racist Kids. Across a 10-year period, I found myself noticing uh, playgrounds exploding with a new mixed-up diversity. It's even started to unfold in rural playgrounds. It's like a rolling tide. It'll, it, it, it's coming. Um, there are more so-called mixed-race kids than ever before. There's more fusion than ever before. And if we took our race-tinted uh, glasses off for long enough, we'd see a generation of kids inventing a model of multi-ethnic, uh, multicultural interaction and cooperation that could teach the adult world a thing or two. But in these same schools, policy requires teachers to watch out for any playground spat, any banter, any misplaced word with a view to recording it as a racist incident. And that's bad policy. Kids become racialized while statistics are then used as evidence of racism in schools, back at home, or in society. And I think it's ironic because the kind of super diversity being uh, interfered with here could really change things. And I'm glad to see uh, that Runnymede's Generation 3.0 project, um, uh, the results of it look fascinating to me. The young people um, it spoke to touch on this very point. This generation don't need racial identity. If we promote that for BME kids, then white working class kids who aren't exactly benefiting from the, uh, the wages of whiteness are gonna want one too. And this generation don't need to be constantly warned about a society we still presume to be dripping in racism. They just need to carry on with what they're already doing and for us to interfere a bit less. So to, to conclude, I, I think the outgoing generation who view the world through the lens of race, be they racists or anti-racists, need to step down and let super diversity step up. And, and, and of course, this is considered a hopelessly naive viewpoint by those who cite institutional racism as the correct and only default explanation for any adversity that befalls BME citizens. And the plight of British Caribbean boys underperforming uh, at schools is continually cited. But these kids, are, as, as has been said, are as affected by poverty, gender, geographical location as anyone else. And in primary... Okay, in you, thank, thank you very much. You're yeah. going to have to oh, stop right. your speed. Thank you. The lady in the front there. Uh, my name is Sylvia Boabradwell, Director of the African People's Advocacy. Um, I agree with Tony in relation to race being a trap. But I do not agree in terms of the, the reason. The reason is not at all class. As somebody who was born in Africa and who came to the UK being an adult, I can certainly identify with uh, what Afua has said in terms of people from a Caribbean background saying you are not a true black because you value education. You are not a true black because you dress the way you do. I have come to the conclusion that Actually, it is because, said, said. it yeah. is because yeah. um, there is an internalized notion yeah. of what being black is. Uh, that comes from a legacy of slavery, whereby you were told you couldn't go to school if you, 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 you were a slave and so on and so on. And these things need uh, to change. However, for the vote, I will vote against. Why? Because there is an assumption um, in the whole question, the, the, in the motion, that people who acknowledge that uh, racism is still a factor are just wanting to complain or to just um, rubbish the society. The main point is that there is a sense of um, Acknowledging that people are not allowed to participate fully in the British society just because of their race or their origin or their accent. We, we are very willing to enrich this society. As an example, you have been told that nobody 